Amy Shark joins me in Jackie Road Studios this week. That is Coolio Gangster's Paradise. Thanks for jumping into Jackie Road, Amy. No worries. Thanks for having me. That is a, you know, you, I think because we're a similar age, we have a lot of crossover in uh, music taste. But what, like, what does that song mean to you? <laughs> Um, I think it was probably one of the coolest songs. Um, it's like, you know how sometimes you hear a song and you just feel cool when you're listening to it? <laughs> um, I, I remember it coming out and it was it was like a really um, big introduction to sort of rap and R&B because I just remember it being a big shift from, you know, liking, I don't know, the Spice Girls and Backstreet Boys and yeah, it's all sure, of a sudden sure. it's like Coolio. <laughs> and, and then from Coolio you go into like, um, I think I fell into like the offspring and silver chair and stuff like that. So it was just like a real, um, switch up of alternative. Like just, re- I think it was like me realizing, Oh, I like, I like alternative stuff. I don't really like, um, you know, the kids stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about that song on the, my radio show the other day and someone told me, I think it came out in 1996. It was the highest selling single of that year, which I couldn't believe. I thought it was more like, yeah, you knew, if you knew, if you're alternative, you knew about it, but no, apparently it was the biggest song of the year. Well, I mean, rightfully so. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I still like, I still walk into the kitchen even today and just go, what's going on in the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> and then those bands like, I mean, you, you speak in straight to me, like Offspring and like the bands that came out in the late 90s, um, you know, those kind of punk bands like Green Day and Blink-182 and all those. Uh, totally. Did, did they, yeah, like you, that was you as well? Yeah, I, it, you know, you go into a, I went into a real big punk sort of stage, that emo-y kind of nasal punk. Um, the Tom DeLonge uh, voice. The Tom DeLonge <laughs> voice and Newfound Glory and MXPX and early November and like Taking Taking Back Sunday, just heaps of really, um, yes, I don't know, yes, that was yes. just like a real, a real movement at the time and everyone was wearing skinny jeans and um, it was awesome. It was a real it was a real time a real fun time like I listen to that music and it takes me back to um, really feral pubs and clubs I used to go to but also really fun times with my friends because we were all we were all just living for this music and going to shows and going to gigs and festivals and yeah it just brings back really good memories yeah I bet it would bring back good memories for me as well except I never stopped listening to that music and I still it's the first thing I choose when I stream <laughs> music or put music on in the house or put music on in the car yeah is, uh, I'd never really really grew out of it no I still I still always go back to it but um I think there was you know when sometimes you get like that one key person that kind of shows you another way to music and I, I started working at this clothing store and my manager at the time there um like the store manager was into like uh, the Avalanches and Amy Winehouse and um, Propeller Heads and mm-hmm. all this cra- and Faithless and and I think from there um it my I guess I was really open to just listening to, to so much more. And um, cause I'd been trapped in the punk scene and I didn't even want to know about any other music. I didn't even want to know about any other genre. Yep. It was like, no, nah, I'm punk, I'm hardcore. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I just remember hearing all these other alternative groups and DJs and, you know, R and B groups and stuff. So it was just like, yeah, it was really, really cool time. I think for music. And you were in a punk band in high school, were you? Oh, if you could call it that. No, that can't be. I, I, you know what? I asked Liam Stapleton just the other week the same question and he tensed up in the same way like, I don't want to talk about the, <laughs> the atrocities of my high school. But, I mean, I was in a shit punk band in high school as well. I feel like you got to just embrace where you came from, right? Yeah, I, you know what? I look, At the time, you, you go through stages where you're like, oh, it's so cringy and... Um, But then I found some footage the other day and, you know, you look at what, I look at what I'm wearing and I'm just like, oh God, Amy, what the hell were you thinking? But when I look back, it's actually, uh, I just thought I was Axl Rose. I really did. I just like had his bandana on and my hair was completely straight and just wearing a tartan skirt and, and, you know, ripped sort of um, stockings. I just, I went through a real sort of gothic stage, had a few breakups and I think I was just 
I think I was just broken. Dude, I did, <laughs> but, um, I did the Axl Rose bandana as well. I mean, I feel like somebody yeah. in every high school did the Axl Rose bandana. Why my friends never told me not that that was a bad look and that with my curly hair, I wasn't really pulling it off the same way. I don't know. <laughs> I know, but you got to look, that's just a part of growing, isn't it? Like I look back and, and, and even some of the really shitty songs, I'm like, there's a bit of hook, there's a bit of a hook in that. Like there's a, there's a tiny melody, like we kind of knew what we were doing, but it was so loud and aggressive and angry. And, you know, it was, it was an all girl band and we were all loving, like, I, I think my bassist was into like, um, Soulfly, like Rob Zombie. And then another girl in it was into like, just, just living for Nirvana and, and then I was kind of going through a real teen and Sarah modest mouse sort right. of vibe. So it was just like we were all had our had our issues. And were you <laughs> writing the songs and singing? I was writing them with another girl, yeah. Um, and it was it was so much fun. And it, it, it but it also taught me really early on um, that bands are really hard work, like to get everyone there and is everyone as committed as what I am and, yeah. and, and then everyone's got to put money in and it was, and obviously at that time in my life, we were all at like uni and no one had any money and I think the drummer got pregnant and it was just like really, it was just like hard. It was hard work. It was really hard work. And then I think the more I started, you know, I think like Missy Higgins and that was coming out. And yep. it just gave everyone, it gave females especially, um, a chance to, to be like, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe I could just do this by myself because I, I really did enjoy just like really like writing everything myself. So I enjoyed that time, but but um, yeah, I think I'm I was always meant to be a solo <laughs> artist. Yeah, right. And do you still write songs the same way? Do you like uh, do you write songs just on acoustic guitar or like where does it mostly start? Yep, um, acoustic guitar. I think at that stage I had an electric and I was just, you know, loving the distortion pedal. But uh, yeah. I think oh, do you, do you once- Like the first time you get a distortion pedal, you just turn everything up to full. Uh, it's Yeah, I know. And there's just the big power chords and yeah. basically anything Blink was doing I wanted to do. And, um, and, and I think it, it kind of gave you hope if you weren't a natural like I mean I I love guitar and I used to just that's all I did I played guitar every day after school until dinner time and then I'd still go back in my room after dinner and keep playing so I got I got good uh but watching people like bands like Blink it's like I don't need to be a total shredder I don't need to learn the classic style they just do what they do and I think that's what gave me real motivation to just do what I wanted to do because it was allowed bands were doing that bands weren't didn't sound like mariah carey they weren't playing this big classical sort of uh intricate led zeppelin style it was easy it was like three power chords so yeah. to me and it I, was doable <laughs> i even love watching bands like blink 102 and other punk bands around that time of shows you'd go and see and they're not even getting it right half the time when they're no. playing on stage. Like no, Tom, they suck live. Uh, Tom, Tom wasn't very good live. And I, but I remember that gives you like, well, my band sucks, so but it worked for them. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's not as big a uh, deal as I think it is. Yeah, I think there's some, there's some merit in that because I've gone to shows before where technically they're brilliant and they're very well, mm. you know, rehearsed and everything. And I'm like, it's stale. There's something stale about it. Well, like, for someone like me, that sometimes <laughs> just depresses me like, oh, God, you guys are so good. Like, this is so far away from anything I, I could know. ever do. And now it just kind of bums me out. Yeah, when any shit kind of goes wrong now, I kind of embrace it and think this is real life. And the and I look down at whoever's in the front row and they're just having the time of their life. And I, I just don't take myself too seriously on stage anymore. Yeah. And if I need something, I'll, I'll get it. If I need to take a second, I'll take a second. It's just I'm not as highly strong as I think I was when I first started. But that just comes with doing it a lot. <laughs> Do you worry about getting like the bigger bands get, and I guess when they like get to arenas and get to stadiums, then there's just a expectation of having to be more slick the whole way through. Or do you think you don't have to be like that? Um, I think there's an expectation in some degree. Like I want to, I want to bring a cool cool sort of set up and I, I love you know lighting and and so I want to put effort into that but when it comes to just my personality and and the show itself I just want it to be as if I'm playing in a small kind of you know 200 person venue I just want I still want to tell stories and I still want to 
um, connect as much as possible. It's it's harder. It, it is a lot harder. And yeah. that's why when you see the pros like Adele and Taylor work that um, stadium like they do, it's mind-blowing. But yeah, it, can, it and just and proves it like can be done. Don't, don't you think that that is kind of like every second is thought out? I mean, I saw Taylor Swift a couple of years ago on um, – on at Amy Park in Melbourne and it's, it's like every second is thought of and accounted for and the lights match up with the music and, and those mm. fireworks go off here and there. It, it, it does take away, it's an amazing spectacle, but it does take away something about like a live performance. Yeah, she's very slick, but then again, she, I think she has to be. I think that particular show that she wants to deliver mm. has to be, um, you know, very, very well rehearsed and you know you stick to the script and I always like I my uh, partner Shane who's very involved in my management team I'll every every now and then if I go off script I'll see him in the sound booth looking just shaking his head like what are you doing <laughs> and uh, but you know I um I kind of like that I, I yeah. gotta I gotta have a bit of free you know and, and he loves that too like it's just like I don't know maybe I'll tell the story differently tonight or um, but but you know that's that's just me as an as an artist and and I'm nowhere near the Taylor level. Maybe if I ever got to Taylor's level, I would agree and say nope, everything has to be like this because otherwise it won't run smoothly. And you know for this reason and that reason, I don't think anyone will really understand this the size of those shows and what what yeah. goes into them. And you know so. Uh, I give it to her because if you don't, if you didn't go to, if you didn't go to multiple shows, she makes you feel like this is her favorite show and you are her favorite person. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a very amazing skill. So what are the biggest shows that you've played? What, what's the biggest audience you've played to? I think Firefight, that was probably like the, you know, the big um, sort of, uh, charity festival yep. that we put on um you know it was like seventy thousand people and there was a real crazy feeling in the air it, it was so electric and it felt like a live aid or something i don't know when you look out to that many people it was it was really incredible but i kind of like that that day i realized um that I really get off on that. <laughs> like I really, I need, like I love. Yeah, 70,000 on nothing. People. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was probably bad. Yeah. I was talking to um, a couple of other artists and yeah. they're like, oh, this has set us up for yeah. failure, you know, this feeling. But um, I don't know, some some other artists don't like it. Some other artists would rather. Um, but but I, I just think, wow, it's just so, it's so terrifying, but electric. And what is it like playing? You play a bunch of festivals like here and, and overseas as well, don't you? Yeah. Is fe- it, what, what, how's a festival compared to a solo show? Um, you just put your different hats on, I guess. Like in uh, festivals are just fun. Like everything's a bit looser. Like um, it's not so like some shows, especially in the major cities, you know, you've got your label there, you've got all these people that you need to meet and talk to and mingle with. And then you've also got the show coming up. So it's, it's really intense. And it's, you know, you look out, it's all these people are here to see you, Mm -hmm. you know, people, people in catering, people, people are there because of you. And once you realize that it's like, Oh my God, it's, it's, it's full on, but festivals, I don't know. It's like, man, if you're there at my stage at that time, let's party. Like, this is great. Um, because there's so many other options you could, you could be at, but, um, when you look out and you see so many people there at your set at wherever you are, Splendor, Lola, whatever, it's like, this is, this is so much fun. And it's just a relaxed sort of energy, I guess, at, at festivals. I think every artist loves festivals. Do you ever take time, put time aside before a new tour or like going going to festivals to actually think about on stage antics and like, oh, these are some gimmicks I could do or like uh, I might invent a new thing for me to do on stage this tour? Um, hmm. I sort of... Because I've got I'm a good really, one if you need, if you're looking for anything, oh, I've got a good you tell, one. <laughs> what have you got? You give it to me. Tell me. Tell me your idea. All right. Well, you know how Freddie used to walk around without the full microphone stand? He just had the top half of the microphone stand. Uh-huh. Yeah. We were painting our house and we had this uh, extendable paint pole. And when it's at its shortest, it's about the same size as Freddie walked around with the microphone, right? 
Yeah. So you have the extendable paint pole, you're singing into it like Freddie, and then at a part where you want the crowd to sing, you chuck it into full extension three metres over the crowd oh, and they sing wow. into the microphone. And you can have that. That is incredible. It's just like having like a, a like a inspector gadget arm. Yeah, that's right. Like, and I imagine like you would get it uh, custom made. You don't ha- actually have to yeah. use a paint pole, but yours will be able to retract back in again with the push of a button. I like that. Do you know Manson did something very similar, not with a microphone, but right. when I saw um, he did the Golden Age of Grotesque tour and um, he had, it was like a, it was like a theater show. Honestly, it was just mind blowing, but he kind of like was raising sort of up like elevating but he obviously had, was on stilts that sort of came up and right. then his arms came out like into the audience it was it was nuts so Wait, what do you mean I, like his arms extended out <laughs> like he was he was uh, behind this big sort of priest lectern thing and just it was all just getting bigger and bigger and then his and then he put his arms out but then they kept extending out like his arms were just like hovering over the crowd all right that really mental. is inspector gadget stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah. He obviously had this. He obviously had this built sort of built um, device behind him that would go out into the. I don't know. I was trying to work out how he did it, but it was it was pretty awesome. So I like. Yeah, I like your idea. Your your idea sounds a lot cheaper to do. <laughs> so, well. Yeah, really. Hey, but do you see shows now and go like, I'll steal some of that for my own show? Yeah, there's definitely, definitely. I think artists like to go and borrow. Um, it's funny because I'll I'll say to you know my friends I'm going to go check out this show and they're like oh god I, I, how do you how can you listen to that music or whatever it's like no I'm just going to steal ideas <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't really give a shit about yeah. their music <laughs> but like um, yeah. yeah it's 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 in it's good and it's fun and um, you know it's it, it, it it's hard because you get to a stage where you no longer enjoy shows like because you're in venues all the time and you're at festivals all the time. So that, that sparkle that used to be there as to why you'd go and line up and you'd, you'd go to so many gigs, it kind of goes sadly when when you're just forever living in venues. That's sad actually. And I, I've thought that in the past about like, when, when, you, when you get to a super stardom stage, right, where you couldn't even walk through a crowd without people recognizing you, um, you, you, you couldn't go to gigs and just stand in the crowd anymore. No, no. It's, and then it's funny because I've tried to do that before and put a hat on and then, and then what, what they do is they, <laughs> they usher you to yeah. the sound booth and it's like, I'm better off just being here, man. I'm better off just not being in the in somewhere where people look to see who's in the sound booth. You know what I mean? Like I'm better off just hanging by the bar or something. So, yeah. um, so when yeah, was the last no. time you were just in the crowd, like in the thick of it? Who were you watching? Um, where did I go? I went to a Simple Creatures show uh, in, yeah. um, which is Mark Coppice's yeah, band with um all-time low guy and um I, it was it was awesome and i think just because i'm not like someone in the states where people are like oh my god it's amy shark i'm like i'm, I'm building a fan base there it's yep. getting nice and strong but it's it, the only reason i think people noticed me um there was i came straight from promo and i still had my hair up and um and then obviously I had the song with Mark, so people were putting the two together. But right. um, but it was still it was it was so fun. Amer- America and LA are very different. They don't like freak out. They yeah. just you know I think they're kind of used to just seeing big big time celebs just going to get a burrito. So has but the, I think that was my last one. Has the hair become so iconic for you now that like you can't not wear your hair like that when you play? It gets. You know, it kind of annoys me because I, I, I love like I wear my hair like that because sometimes I just think my head looks flat, and that's why I used to wear like I used to wear my hair like that all the time. And and you know, my partner's like, oh, it looks really pretty. And but now, if I wear my hair out like that at dinner, I'm scared that people think, oh, she just wants to be, be noticed or whatever. It's like, no, I actually, I actually just wear my hair like this. Yeah. But um, and I can't let you I guys do, see my flat head. Yeah, exactly. My hair's like totally flat and dead and dirty. Most of the time it's just dirty. It's like I can trick people if I put it up. But um, yeah, it's definitely to the stage where I was having dinner and I had a, I had a hat on and mm. um, this lady came over and she was like, oh, can, my daughter's a big fan. Can I bring her over? And I was like, yeah, for sure. And the daughter was like, I don't know, 
five or six or something and she came up to me and she she kind of nestled back into her mum and she's like that's not her <laughs> and her, and her mum's like yeah it is it's Amy and she's like no because she doesn't have the top knot and and the and she was actually terrified and I, I had to like take my hat off and I'm like no no it's me <laughs> it's yeah it's me but um yeah so I was like okay this is a thing this is something and did it happen by accident kinda... or did it did yeah, like, did you make Complete. a plan to like, all right, this this hair now is going to go with me for uh, every time I release no. this hair? No. Oh, God, no. And some people, honestly, some interviews I've had, they're like, so, guy, it's, it's so clever how you just put together the Adidas and that and it all worked. And it's like, who does that? I don't know. I, I never did. I have always worn Adidas. I, I just like, I've had so, I had so many years of guys telling me, wear a dress to this and wear this to that and whatever. And it was like, I'd kind of, I was at the end anyway, I'd given up on music, so it didn't really bother me. But I, so I, when it came time for a door, I said to Shane, I'm like, I'm wearing what I want to wear. And he's like, you should just wear jeans and a t-shirt. And then I I, I used to always put my hair up on a top, not after I'd been to the beach or whatever. But we were in New York and I had um, a meeting with a label and... I just put my hair up like that. I'm like, I think I'm just going to put my hair up. And then, and that was it. And then we went to the meeting and then for some reason, the guy was like, I love your jacket and I love your hair. And I was like, ah, cool. Like, and then that's all it really took. I don't know. And then I love, I love the idea of having a uniform. I just thought how easy, you know, how easy to just know that that's how I do my hair. Yeah. I like how it is. Um, it, it really boosts that alter ego. And then, um, and then I have just like my my outfits that I wear that aren't that I don't have to remember a bunch of different things like different boots and bangles and pieces you know it's just easy and comfortable. So I imagine eventually you heard from Adidas how how far into the whole thing was it that Adidas was like thank you for wearing our clothes. They've been so great. They just um, you know we were working on like these crazy deals and stuff and um, but they were kind of like. You know, obviously, you can't be seen wearing anything else like Adidas. Uh, like, sorry, like Nike or um, P- Puma and stuff. So, to me at the time, I was like, oh, let's just wait. Um, at the moment, they're sending me free stuff. So, that's like, yeah, that's, that's, good that's cool. We'll just keep it like a really chill deal <laughs> at the moment. But, yeah. Yeah, because my sister, I mean, she claims that it's not because of Amy Shark, but she had an uptick in the same striped Adidas type T-shirts. Uh, around the time, like, you know, over the last couple of years. <laughs> nice. That's great. I mean, it's funny because I go to shows and I just look out and there's so many, th- there's yeah. just the three stripes <laughs> everywhere and a sea of top knots and I, I love it. <laughs> it's my little army. Um, let's go back to, uh, I don't want to brush over the Mark Hoppers thing because I'm a huge Blink-182 fan. Please tell me everything, spare no detail about what it was like working on that song. It was really, it was really easy. Um, I, you know, l- luckily enough, he sent me a, a DM saying, oh, I love your music and we've got some friends in common and, and next time you're in LA, um, let's, you know, get a coffee or, you know, whatever. And so, what so, was that moment like? Like you're checking through your DMs and Mark Hoppus drops into your DMs. Yeah. Well, we were actually in Hawaii. It was after a tour, a, yeah. a big tour. And um, we were just taking like a little break before I went back to the States. I was actually on my way back to LA anyway. But I just remember seeing his name pop up and I just looked at Shane. I was like, holy shit, I have a DM from Mark Hoppus. And, um, and it was just like, we both just were so happy. Like, I think we had like, I don't know, a hundred pina coladas that yeah. day. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so I was like, oh, my God, I'm actually coming back to L.A. Like, I would love to meet you. Um, so, yeah, so then we went and had coffee. He was just, just I don't know, telling me everything that I wanted to hear. Um, yes, just tell about, me, tell me. Yeah, just like <laughs> I was talking to him about Conway Studio. I was like, what studios have you worked in here? And I'm like, oh, I worked at Conway. He's like, oh, yeah, we did take off your pants there and we did that. And I was like, oh, my God. And he's just so tall and he looks like Mark Hoppus and he sounds like Mark <laughs> Hoppus. And my heart was just racing. It was the first time I really had a moment. I was like, yeah. oh, wow, this is this guy has soundtracked so much of my life yeah, and so true. I, I, it was the first time I had to really you know my hand was shaking and oh, I was just a mess I was an I, I just I'm usually pretty good and I, I can play it kind of cool but I was a mess that day and then um I got better as the as the you know time went on and, and he was asking me about where I was up to with the record and 
Um, he was super interested. And I, I just, I, I, I'm, pr- I'm, sort of pride myself on reading the room you know like yeah. I, I can read the room if he's just doing this because he knows I'm a fan and whatever yep. but he was asking too many questions right, and like right. how long I was there for and blah 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 and what songs and how many songs left and I'm like oh I mean I've got some more songs I just I mean if you ever wanted to work with uh-huh. me on one, I love that <laughs> and I kind of slid it in quite smoothly and he he jumped at it he was like yeah I'd love to he's like what you just send me send me some and, and I'll have a listen and then so anyway we wrapped it up that night I sent him Psycho and he wrote back straight away he's like Amy I love it um let's do it how long are you here for do you want me to sort out the studio and I was like, I wow. hadn't even asked anyone in my team. Like, no one knew. <laughs> I went, yeah. I went absolutely rogue. Yeah. So, um, and so that's why this time around, everyone's petrified. They're like, Amy, make sure you tell us. We don't care. We'll do whatever you want, but just at least tell us who you're talking to and what might eventuate. But um, so anyway, so was, if the song was, was fully written. He didn't, he didn't add any lyrics or anything. He just came to sing on it. Well, this was the great bit about it. So the song was fully written. I had like, because I was just going to do it myself. Mm. Like I. You know, I still thought it's, it's a great song. And, and, and um, were you going through that night when you're like thinking of what song to send? Do you like, you know, make up a list of like, all right, it could be that one. It could be that one. It could be that one. No, that wouldn't work. This one won't work. To be honest, I think it was always going to be Psycho. Like as I sat there and as he was talking to me, um, and I, an artist that's really in control of their career and if they're like a real songwriter, you know exactly what songs you have in the bank mm-hmm. and where they are and what, what stage they're at. If they could use a feature, like I know, I know every, I've got songs that I just have in my mental bank of what I'm going to do with them and who I'm, who, who's going to produce them and yeah, cool. or who I'm going to try. Yeah. So, it, so straight away I was like, psycho. It's, it's going to happen. His voice is going to sound sick. And I was thinking, I don't even care what he wants to do. He can do a chorus or he, he can do a verse yeah. or whatever. Um, and then, like, so he sorted out the studios, which happened to be the Foo Fighters, like, personal studios in the Valley. So that was... Wait, it's not the hard. Sound City one that Dave Grohl's got in his house. So this, he's got the Sound City desk he bought. Oh, yeah, bought, I've seen the documentary. But, um, oh, my God, that's called? amazing. The desk is called something. Damn it. Yeah, the, um, the desk, like all the buttons and all yeah, the knobs and stuff. Yeah, it's got a name, yeah. but yeah, yeah, the, the Sound City desk. And it's got like, you know, all the signatures from Johnny Cash to, to oh, absolutely man. everybody yeah. uh, on this desk. So I was getting, you know, a lesson in the desk and then <laughs> there's just Grammys everywhere. There's Grammys holding the toilet door open. Like it's crazy. Like Dave Grohl's just got, it's just the coolest, it's the coolest studios ever. So is Dave Grohl there? <laughs> No, he wasn't there, but just the Mark fact Mark Hoppus that has the keys to Dave Grohl's house. Yeah, That's pretty much. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. And I think it was like my first experience of um, like real rock star world. Like because people, I've been around people that have a big profile. Mm. Yeah, they got a bunch of money and whatever. But this was like I turned up in my little Uber and um, – and all of a sudden I had like someone there opening the door. Another person was like getting my guitars and then someone else was like, asked me what I, what I want for lunch and do I want a coffee now? And there was another guy that was going to take me on a tour around the studio. And it was like, Oh shit. That's, this is like what a real rock star looks like. Like, and like so Hoppus did- doesn't move. Like he just sits, he gets his guitars passed to him. People know what he wants. People, it, it was crazy. And did you feel like, was it imposter syndrome feeling or was it like, yeah, I'm here, I've arrived? I always feel that because I think, you know, you'd, you'd be a bit full of yourself to not have that feeling. Mm. And I think it's healthy too when you're just like a little girl from the Gold Coast mm. who's now in um, this massive studio with a, a rock, a full rock legend. So, um, I definitely felt that. But then there's a time where you're like, okay, you got to cut the bullshit now and really step up because, you know, you just, even if you don't feel you belong in these rooms, you got to act like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and I really, I thought that, I thought that I did. And, and I, I love that Mark sort of said, do you mind if I write my own verse? And I was like, oh my God, I'd, I'd love that. That's like, awesome. I, I'd love that more so because yeah. that means, you know, he's more connected to the song. Yeah. And, um, and then you're secretly thinking like, I hope it's good. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's going to be very hard to tell Mark Hoppus that I don't want his verse on the album. I just wouldn't have done it. I just would have, I just would have um, taken it with a grain of salt. But it, luckily, yeah, obviously he's Mark Hoppus for and a so reason. He wrote, did he write it just like in the room on the day yeah. or did he go, that's awesome. He, he went for a little walk and he had his burrito upstairs and, um, and then, yeah, he kind of like texted me and said, oh, come listen to this. And 
And I was like, hey, I love it. Wow, <laughs> I love it. So, cool. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then it was done. It was done in like a, a day and he's got great people around him. Like his guitar tech and, and his, just his people are really great people. So um, got to, you know, make, make more friends and it was, yeah, it was really fun. And is it Billy Corgan working with you on the next album? Oh, oh man, there's so much talk about Billy Corgan, and I I need to start setting it straight. I just, oh, is that not true? Ha- uh, sorry. No, well, I met him, and we and we and he met me. I was working in a studio over there, and um, it, it, my we kind of had friends in common who knew like his manager really well, and then um, he. He knew I was a big fan, and I think he, he he said, "I hear that sharp girls in town." That's what I remember is that sharp girls in town. Um, you know, let's let's see if if she'll have time to meet meet with me. And I was like, I will always have time to meet with Billy Corgan. So he ended up coming to this studio to meet me, and um, we just had a really great chat, like good chat from you know things that everyone wants to hear like Nirvana about Nirvana days and when smashing were like, you know, kicking off yeah. and Courtney love and all sorts of stuff that I just was aching to know. And then I, one great thing came out of it. I played in this song, um, that will be on the album and I was really confused about it. I didn't know why it wasn't working. Mm. And, um, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm going to ask Billy. Like he's the God, like I might as well. And he's like, I think you're making the guitar too confusing. He's like, you're a good guitarist, but your actual forte is melody and lyric. And he's like, if you just play that one note and let it ring out. And, and he was sort of just playing it for me yep. as I held the note down. Oh, and amazing. he's like, now, now, now sing it. And, and I was singing it and I'm like, oh my God. And it, it did. It just made the melody shine and made the story come to the front. And I was like, that's... Even that, it sounds so simple, but it's like I needed him to tell me that, and it, it was just so cool. And now, like when everyone hears this song, I can't wait to talk about it because it was, it, yeah, it's really changed the whole dynamic. Yeah, you have an amazing way of like. I, I, I totally agree with like melody and lyrics, but like the, your songs just have these ache in them that, like, for whatever reason, even if it's in his background music, I find myself like tuning into the lyrics and like really like feeling it every time I put your music on. Oh, thanks, Ian. That's, I mean, that's why I'm here. That's the kind of artist I, that's, that's, what, that's my offering to the world. You know, take it or leave it. But so Billy Corgan isn't on the, on the song? No. No, he's not. Sad. No. Is, but, is, there you know, any, is there anyone like the, the Mark Hoppus uh, feature? Or are you trying to be coy about it because you're not allowed to say yeah? <laughs> I'm trying to be coy oh. as possible. But, I, but I, I do, I can say that I have got two pretty awesome features uh, on the album. All oh, right, beside Billy Corgan. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, well, Ted, I know I'm so, I've now feel like just going through a list of really cool people and asking you if they're them or not and trying to detect in your voice. <laughs> yeah, I it's know. Alive. I know, God, I'm so bad too because, yeah, I'm just so bad at this. But because I'm, I'm just like so excited and I'm trying yeah. to like not, I'm trying to not be as gobby as I was on the first album and just sit back and, and let people just listen to the music. But it's hard when you're so pumped up about something and so excited and I'm just sitting here with it and, yeah. No one even knows. <laughs> so, and so, what is that other people who make decisions about like how to release singles and like, oh, you got to wait this long for the first one, then another one, then we can release the album. And- yeah. I mean, it's so loose right now, dude. Like yeah. it's so, no one really, I mean, people know there's a big plan and obviously there's many people in my team and internationally as well. So, it's, I'm really respectful of that. But then there's times like, you know, we had a single coming out and the world was not only sick with Corona, but we also had um, a massive Black Lives Matter movement that was, you know, in the middle of what, what when I was going to try and, you know, um, uh, right. so promote is this, a song. Is this for that Everybody Rise single? Yeah, right. yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, and you it's can't things really like that that like, are popping up yeah. in the world. And if you don't say it, you know, the your team, you know, uh, there's times every, every now and then that I really do need to you know, voice my opinion of, no, I don't feel right doing this yeah. and this doesn't feel like the right time. And, um, but yeah, it's so, it's so, it's a weird space at the moment for every artist. I think the, the way you used to do things and the, yeah. the usual setup and it's, 
you know, I think it's a good thing because some teams out there treat artists like, oh, you roll it out and every artist is the same. It's like, we're not. And it's um, it's time to shake it up and listen to the artist and, and um, you know, just do things when they feel right. Yeah, well, yeah. it's your music. So, are you allowed to say, is there a period do you know when the album's coming out and you're not allowed to say or can you say or you don't know i can't i'm so sorry no, that's all right that's all right <laughs> but but the thing is i mean you you know like you're a good music guy and you're in the industry you know it can't be far so that's that's my little hint the, the other one i heard and i mean i guess i'm gonna get the same answer from you but ed sheeran helped you like either worked on it or features on the album in some way i have a song that i wrote with ed sheeran and it's um it's very incredible, and he. Um, Even the he, way I you learned... answer the question makes it feel robotic, like somebody's got a gun <laughs> to your back. I know, yeah. I, I have do. one song with Ed Sheeran. <laughs> I have, a, I have written a song. I know. I'm like, I'm p- petrified, like thinking someone's gonna like sniper me. Um, no, yeah. So look, I I can't wait, and hopefully we can talk again because there's so much to say and unpack about that whole session because. The, what I learned from just observing that guy and how he has set up his life and how he is as a human being and how he goes about songwriting is like the the lessons I learned that day were are gonna I'm gonna benefit from them for the rest of my life. It was just such a incredible experience. So it's it's gonna be really really fun for me to um to talk about this this next album. Have you changed the way you write music now after meeting all these kind of people and 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 just the experience of like having done it for so long? Do you change does it change the way you write songs? Not really. Not not to not really. Like I I feel like I've just gotten better and and, and I'm not saying that to to be big headed. I'm just saying like when you when you work at something mm. and when you do it every day you're going to get better at any, anything you do every day like that's just how it works like so I think the more I sort of flex my songwriting muscle it just becomes a bit easier and I, and I get to know myself more and and I learn what I want to share and what I don't want to and I, I learn what makes up a good melody and and good chords and how when to switch it up I don't know it's just like it honestly is like even your job I'm sure you've gotten way better at doing your job because you you do it more and you've done it more and you've you know you learn from the last one and it's yeah I just feel like and and obviously I learn little tips and tricks along the way um even listening to to artists I listen to Taylor and I listen to Ed and I listen to Ariana and and just like although my music is is a little different and maybe a slightly alternative version of that but it's still the structure is genius and the way they execute it and the production style is like so slick so that's the main thing i wanted to do with this next album is like really learn to to make an album that can talk to the world and not just australia oh that's interesting so how outside of australia is it the u.s that's the the biggest fans of amy shark or the uk or who do you find uh, the U.S. is growing really strongly. Like you know, it sucks about the whole not not no travel yeah. at the moment because I was building something really exciting over there. Um, and you know, it's still building online. And um, yeah, I've got strong fan base there. Canada, um, surprisingly Germany because um, they put us they put a door. I think it was like a perfume commercial or something. So it's right. just you know, maybe the, the world of sync. The, the Adidas clothing, maybe the Germans appreciate. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think they're really they're kind of intrigued. And they all they all look at the hair like, how do you do the hair? <laughs> all right, Amy. Thanks so much for joining me in Jackie Road Studios. Um, I can't wait to hear the new songs. Can't wait to hear Billy Corgan's voice, Ed Sheeran's voice. <laughs> I heard you say Ariana Grande at one point, so I'm sure she's oh, yeah, on for the sure. album. Let's start. Let's start these rumors. I love it. <laughs> That's all I need. Right right now uh thanks so much for coming in no worries dude appreciate the chat bye